Sarah Ellis sent her sister a text telling her how safe she felt at her new job at a remote mountain lodge in North Carolina. Later that same week, Sarah's body was found in the nearby forest. She had been beaten, sexually assaulted, and strangled. This is Monsters. Twenty-nine-year-old Sarah Ellis had dreams of becoming a chef. Her favorite hobbies all centered around food, whether it was watching cooking shows in her spare time, or trying to perfect her baking techniques in the apartment she lived in with her older sister. She knew that, in the culinary industry, you had to start from the bottom and work your way up. So in 2018, she decided to apply for a job as a cook at the Pisca Inn, an isolated lodge in the mountains of North Carolina. The inn had been previously voted as the country's best national park lodge, and was a popular workplace for young people all over the United States due to its breathtaking location on the famous Blue Ridge Parkway. Sarah's job application was accepted, and she started preparing to move out on her own. For her, the most important thing was that the job would give her the opportunity to further her career. The beautiful surrounding scenery and the staff accommodation at the lodge was just an added bonus. Sarah made the move to the Pisca Inn, joining around 40 other employees who lived in the lodge's staff dorms, located a few hundred yards away from the inn itself. The dorm rooms were simple but comfortable, with twin-sized beds and shared dressers. For seasonal employees, it felt similar to being away at summer camp. Over the first few months of Sarah's employment, everything went according to plan. Throughout Sarah's life, her hearing impairment had made almost everything more difficult. Although she still had a small amount of hearing, she was almost completely deaf. Despite her impairment and the isolated nature of her new job, she felt at home at the Pisca Inn, safely tucked away in a small community of friendly staff. Despite now living on site at the inn, Sarah kept in touch with her family, especially her older sister, Tiffany Coleman. The two sisters had a significant age gap of 12 years, and throughout Sarah's childhood, Tiffany had helped to raise her. Even in adulthood, Tiffany still felt the urge to look after her younger sister, who had always been sensitive, kind, and generous to a fault. After their mother died of cancer, the sisters came to rely on each other even more for support and guidance. When Tiffany checked in on Sarah via text, Sarah gushed about her new job, telling her sister that she'd quickly made several friends at the inn, which she called, quote, a safe place. Then, Sarah suddenly stopped replying to Tiffany's messages. The next day, Tiffany got a call from staff at the Pisca Inn that made her heart sink. She received news that something terrible had happened to her younger sister. The tragic turn of events at the Pisca Inn began slowly, and quickly snowballed into something that the Quiet Lodge had never seen before. On July 25th, somebody knocked on the door of the inn manager's office. It was another one of the inn's employees, 20-year-old Derek Sean Pendergraft. Derek worked at the inn as a housekeeper and mostly kept to himself, so it was unusual for him to ask to speak to the manager. Like Sarah, this was his first season working at the inn. Derek told the general manager that he wanted to report his co-worker, Sarah Ellis, as missing. He and Sarah had been hiking one of the nearby trails together, but it had started to rain and Sarah had turned back. Derek had lost track of his hiking buddy, expecting her to be back at the lodge, but when he arrived back after his walk, there was no sign of her. There was just a few hours left before Sarah's shift was due to begin, and after the lodge was searched, nobody reported seeing any sign of her. At 7.30 that evening, the inn's general manager made a call to Blue Ridge Parkway Dispatch, telling them that one of the inn's employees had gone missing in the surrounding wilderness. Sarah's hearing impairment made her vulnerable, and everybody was concerned that she may have somehow gotten lost or injured, making her unable to find her way back to the lodge. She wouldn't be able to hear search parties calling for her, and in just a few hours, it would be getting dark. Despite these obvious concerns for Sarah's well-being, in the early stages of the search, nobody thought that foul play was a possibility, especially since Derek had been so quick to report Sarah missing. 
Derek repeated his original story to authorities as the search for the missing woman began, adding more details. After he and Sarah finished their shift at 4 p.m., they decided to spend some time together by hiking along one of the many public trails that wound through the forest by the employee dorms. They'd only been walking for a short time when it began to rain, making the trail slippery and more difficult to walk on. Derek hadn't been bothered and he wanted to continue hiking, but Sarah felt differently and decided to turn around and go back to the lodge. Derek had continued on his hike alone, walking for around an hour before he began the journey back to the dorms. When he passed the point where Sarah had decided to turn around, he saw that her umbrella and the hat that she'd been wearing had been left behind. That had concerned Derek, which was why he rushed to report her as missing. Less than three hours into the search, Sarah was found by the teams of park rangers and first responders that were combing the area. She was close to the scenic Blue Ridge Parkway, lying by an embankment that was obscured from view by thick, overgrown forest. It was almost surprising that it had taken so long to find her as she was right by the narrow path that connected the employee accommodation to the inn itself. But this wasn't a happy discovery. In fact, the condition in which Sarah's body was found changed the course of the investigation completely. It was immediately clear that Sarah was deceased and her cause of death hadn't been a hiking injury or exposure to the elements. There was obvious bruising on her face and neck and her body hadn't been found on the trail where she'd supposedly disappeared. Sarah's autopsy later revealed that, while her cause of death was asphyxia due to strangulation, she had also been beaten before her death, causing severe injuries to her limbs, torso, and head. When it came to suspects, there was only one. The only person who had known that she was going hiking. The man who had reported her as missing while knowing that she was never going to return from that hike. Sarah Ellis's killer was her friend and co-worker, Derek Pendergraft. Sarah's friends and family later described her as, quote, the sweetest person you'd ever meet. She was kind, trusting, and always saw the best in people. When Derek invited her on that hike, she likely never considered that he was being anything but friendly. Derek used Sarah's trusting nature to his advantage, luring her into the woods to attack, assault, and murder her. Derek's story changed when he willingly confessed to Sarah's murder, and he told the investigators that he had completely blacked out at some point during his walk with her. He had no idea what had taken place during that time period, but when he came back to himself, he was looking straight into Sarah's eyes and somehow she had died. Regardless of Derek's claims that he had blacked out and had no idea how Sarah died, it became clear that she had been killed while she was being sexually assaulted by Derek. It was likely that a sexual interest in Sarah was what led to Derek's decision to kill her. Sexual assault charges were added to the original murder charge when Derek was indicted by a grand jury, who stated that Derek had murdered Sarah, quote, willingly, deliberately, maliciously, and with premeditation, and in the perpetration of and an attempt to perpetrate aggravated sexual assault. Derek was quiet when he arrived in federal court, wearing a brown jumpsuit with shackles on his ankles. The district judge addressed Derek, giving him the opportunity to speak for himself in front of the courtroom. Quietly, Derek declined. Sarah's older sister Tiffany was traumatized by the violent, senseless death of her sibling. In her victim impact statement, she described the way Sarah's death had changed her view of the world. She didn't trust men anymore. The world that used to be a safe place now felt full of danger and evil. Telling the courtroom about how scared Sarah must have been in her last moments, Tiffany struggled to hold back tears. While listening to Tiffany's statement, Derek slowly covered his face with his hands, as if he was trying to hide from her words. Derek's attorney, Emily Jones, called the case, quote, an enormous tragedy. She referenced the court files with information about Derek's background as part of that tragedy, but because those documents are sealed, the information they contain isn't publicly known. Jones told the court, quote, There were many missed opportunities where Derek's life could have gotten back on track. Derek pleaded guilty to the charges against him, one count of first-degree murder and two counts of aggravated sexual abuse that resulted in death. He received three life sentences without the possibility of parole. The rest of Derek's life will be spent behind bars. While reading the sentences, the judge echoed Emily Jones's earlier words describing the case as, quote, amongst the saddest he had seen. 
He said, quote, Derek Pendergraft has a truly sad background, and he has had experiences in life that have given him no real opportunity to develop as a normal child. The judge and Derek's attorney both hoped that being in the prison system would give Derek the structure he needed to be rehabilitated in some way, saying that while in jail he would get the treatment for his, quote, history of mental health issues, as well as his sexual deviancy and drug addiction. The severity of Derek's sentencing was a relief to the family of his victim. Tiffany said, quote, Thank God he can't do it to anyone else. At the sentencing, U.S. Attorney Murray also responded to Derek's life sentence, saying, quote, Today's sentence will not bring Sarah back to her family and friends who miss her and think about her every day, but it is my sincere hope that everyone impacted by this heinous crime can find solace in knowing that Sarah's killer will never walk free among us again. All Sarah wanted was a friend, but sadly, instead, she met a monster. If you're the victim of domestic abuse, please reach out to someone for help. Please talk to your local shelter or call the National Domestic Abuse Hotline at 1-800-799-SAFE. That's 1-800-799-7233. Or you can go to thehotline.org to chat with someone online. This website is set up so that, at any time, hitting the escape key twice will take you to a Google search page. That way, if your abuser is nearby, you won't get caught seeking help. If you're having feelings of harming yourself or someone else, or even just need someone to talk to, please contact your local mental health facility. Call 911 or call the National Suicide Prevention Hotline by simply dialing 988 in the United States. They're available 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, and will talk to you about any mental health issue you may be facing. If you are a member of the LGBTQ community and suffering from discrimination, depression, or are in need of any support, please contact the LGBT National Hotline at 1-888-843-4564 or go to lgbthotline.org. Thanks so much for letting me tell you this story. If you enjoyed it, subscribe on whatever platform you're on, hit like, rate us, or leave us a comment. You can check out our other show, Somewhere Sinister, on YouTube or anywhere you listen to podcasts. If you'd like to support the show, check out our merchandise at thisismonsters.com. The link is in the description. Thanks again, and be safe.